All righty. <clears throat> How was morning tea? Excellent, excellent. <coughs> uh, let me start this, uh, this talk. There's lots of healthy signs at Tom's. Uh, I want to say that. Uh, there's lots of healthy signs here at Tom's. And I'm convinced our church uh, longs to love God and love our neighbour. But like many churches... Uh, becoming Christians or seeing people become Christians can feel like a really slow drip. It feels like we can, we're almost in, in holding patterns a lot of the time. <clears throat> so again, this session, uh, I want to move from some of the theological truths that were the first part of uh, session one, uh, theological truths that I think essentially we all agree on and, and keep pushing into some of the, the practical biblical outworkings of those things that uh, often churches need to keep developing their thinking on. Uh, some people will say, well, I've always thought that. Others will be thinking, oh, I hadn't really thought of it that way. Uh, it's a bit of a combination. But again, as I said, um, <clears throat> part of what we're doing is pilfering from uh, churches who think like we do, believe like we do, uh, but have been able to continue growing in ways that uh, many of us, many churches like us, have struggled to do. <clears throat> um, and so I, I, Brad and, and Fiona mentioned it early on. You've heard me say it before. I've pr probably already mentioned it today, but my, my brain's going. But uh, Anglican churches here in Sydney, we're really good at growing to around 200 people. Um, there's papers... There's academic papers written on growth barriers and things like that. And 200 is uh, where we get to. And, and sometimes when we've got really good momentum at that point, we nudge 250. And what often happens is we slowly drift back to 150 or so. Um, that's the zone, uh, the stage of church life we're in. Uh, the way out, the way forward, we need to embrace change. Uh, many of us have known for 10 years that, that Tom's has needed to develop to keep healthy and growing. But those of us who have known that also know that we've lived through a long and difficult journey in so many areas of life during this period. And while we've nibbled away at things, and to your credit... Uh, we've tried and experimented with different things. Uh, part of today is, is highlight some important and common ways of thinking that we need to keep developing and, and push into a little bit more. Uh, like I said it earlier, I, I wish I'd understood them 15 years ago. And I think if we can develop our thinking in these areas, and we're going to address uh, three more of them to go with the biblical care of numbers that we uh, looked at in the last session, I think under God we can expect to see the gospel have a bigger and bigger impact on our region. So four, four areas churches need to develop. We talked about uh, a biblical care about numbers. <clears throat> so we're up to number two. And it's develop a stronger theology of the sovereignty of God. So here's a pop quiz. It's a quite a short pop quiz. It has one question in it. You might just want to write down the answer in your out in your in your booklet. I've just been I've been talking about numbers. We're talking about growth. Here's the question in our pop quiz: Who gives the growth to church? Who gives the growth to church? <clears throat> if you can quote num chapter and verse, um, uh, well done. Uh, most of you have just heard an answer to that. Uh, if you're paying attention to the Bible reading there in 1 Corinthians. Did you write something like this? Neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes it grow. God makes the gospel grow in people's lives. Now, that raises some questions. Does that mean what or how we do things doesn't actually matter? 
because it's God who gives the growth. If it doesn't matter, then what is my responsibility? What is our responsibility? What, what is our part in making disciples? Does it even go, is it, is it as far or does it extend as far as we'll just be faithful? Our responsibility is make sure we faithfully uh, pass the gospel on. Now, I want to tease this out and, and push our thinking into how right or wrong that is. God, God gives the growth and we simply have to be faithful. <clears throat> and I want to use the language of inputs and outputs. Inputs being what we do, outputs being the result that comes from that. In some ways it's workplace language, but it's actually very situational in life, isn't it? There's inputs, there's outputs. Now, in a, in a church context where we're dealing with people, again, it's language that I find a little bit awkward, a bit like when I first mentioned numbers. Uh, outputs feels a little um, maybe even totally impersonal. Maybe outcome is a, a gentler word than output, but I think it probably grates as well. <clears throat> but whatever language we use, we need to think about the connection between what do we do and what is the result? Right? God's outcome, what's God's outcome? It's that people will be saved. The task Jesus has given us is to make disciples of all nations. So the outcome of our task is more and more disciples. And we've already started pushing that around in the first session. What's the chief input for making more and more mature disciples? Well, it's the word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? God's word in the power of the Spirit, bringing people to repentance and faith and then transforming their lives. The chief input is, is the, clearly the word of God. And God is the one who changes people's lives as he works by his word and his spirit in the lives of people as Jesus is presented. Now, Tom's one of uh, the things that I cherish about Tom's is that we're passionate uh, about digging into the word of God deeply. And this is going to sound like um, an oxymoron, or you might just say, Adam, you are a moron. Uh, I've been encouraged by the negative reaction of changing the name of our midweek groups. I've been encouraged by the negative reaction. We've changed the name from Bible study groups to growth groups and people have reacted against that. Why? Because you cherish studying the Bible. It's a great strength. But the language of growth group is the outcome that we're after. When we meet in those groups midweek, what do we want to happen? We want to see growth in discipleship. We want to see... Christians growing up as disciples. What One of the chief inputs, the, the, the big central input is studying the Bible. It's also prayer and it's also caring for one another, spurring one another on correct, teach, rebuke, encourage. But the name change is to identify what do we want to see happening. We want to see growth in discipleship. As an aside, um, not as an aside, as really important co-text, uh, our numbers in growth groups have dropped off a little bit. Uh, currently, we have 65% of people uh, who are regular at church in our growth groups. I'd love to see that at 80%. Just by the way, I never want to see it at 100%. Can anyone tell me why I never want to see it at 100%? No, because we always want new people coming in. It, it is the growth idea. It is we're gr growing. But, yeah, because if, if if we're at 100%, who's, who's still coming in? Um, if you're not in a growth group, have I got a deal for you? Thursday night, 7.30, in the ministry centre, explore starts, there's your way back into a growth group. Start doing the explore group six weeks. Taste, see, it's, it's, it's in you go. 
and then we can continue on from there. Uh, our growth groups are a crucial aspect of loving God and loving our neighbor, meeting personally around God's word with others to learn and spur one another onto maturity in Christ through the Bible, praying together, caring and loving one another with the outcome that we're after more and more mature disciples. And here's where we where we need to check if if needed, develop our theology of the sovereignty of God. Where does where is the connection between what I do and what happens? Between our teaching and studying the word and disciples being made and matured. Here's option number one. <clears throat> my input, my doing, directly controls the outcome. What do I mean by that? Do these six things, you will get this result. Pray this way, preach this way, use this program, then your church is going to have the same growth as a mega church over there. Inputs control the output. It's actually classic, charismatic, and also Roman Catholic thinking. The problem we hit with import controls the output is 1 Corinthians 3. We plant, we water, but it's God who gives the growth. So we in our inputs don't dictate, don't control the outcomes. So it's part of the majesty and the glory of God. He's free. He is sovereign. And it's up to him to determine how he blesses every church. So... Option one, input controls output, is clearly wrong. If we turn the page, option number two, our inputs have no relationship to the outputs, right? Swing it the other way, really. The inputs, the what we do, have no relationship at all to the outputs. Our ministries have no effect on the outcome. We preach and we teach, we pray, we be faithful, and whatever happens, say la vie, God will do what God will do. Some things he might bless abundantly. Other things, it'll be the proverbial digging up concrete with a bamboo knife and fork. Now, there's something attractive in that one. It does justice to the sovereignty of God, doesn't it? It protects our hearts because when there's successes, we don't take pride in that. It was all of God. It protects our sense of worth when, when things seem to fail. Oh, well, it was, that's what God wanted. So it protects our hearts, hearts and our sense of worth. We can at least rest, well, I was faithful and I, and I tried. The problem with that is it's just not biblical. Uh, in Acts chapter 14, I'll, I'll just put up the references Acts chapter 14 uh, says, At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. What did they do? There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. Uh, Acts chapter 18, every Sabbath Paul reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Acts chapter 19, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Right? Paul's not simply a proclaimer, he's a persuader. Uh, Acts chapter 28, Paul witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. Now, for all the great apostles' efforts, some were convinced and believed, others wouldn't believe. As we read through Acts, the ones that didn't believe usually attacked him and chased him and beat him and uh, sent him off, you know, off he went to another town or jail. But Paul clearly ministers in the belief that what he does impacts the outcome. He doesn't just deliver a message, he reasons, he convinces, he argues, he persuades. He believes what he's doing impacts the outcome. So that then brings us to option three. Inputs and outcomes are actually tied together through these two things, the sovereignty of God and our labours. <clears throat> so Romans chapter 10 is a great passage that ties these two things together, uh, the sovereignty of God and our labours. Uh, Romans 10, 14 and 15, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? 
And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Faith comes by hearing. It doesn't just happen. God in his sovereignty does choose. And even though he could save however he likes, he's tied himself to the preaching and teaching of the word. So Paul says, we've got to preach this word. We've got to send people to preach this word, which is 1 Corinthians 3 again, the very passage that that can often be used to separate inputs and outputs. 1 Corinthians 3 says uh, their work will be shown for what it is because the day, the, the day of judgment will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss. See, Paul there is talking about the outcome, whether what has been built survives. And when you get down to verse 17 of of 1 Corinthians 3, he puts it even more starkly. God will destroy the person who destroys the temple. It is possible for us to destroy God's temple in the ministry that we do. God's sovereign, we're responsible. Our input might not control the outcome, but the outcome doesn't come apart from what we do. Uh, I'll just put this in. Uh, Watch your life and doctrine closely, Paul says to Timothy. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, Paul hasn't jumped back there to input controls the outcome. If you watch your life and doctrine, you will save your hearer. Paul's saying that how we live, how we love, how we minister does make a difference. My clarity on the gospel makes a difference, right? This is our love of God and love of neighbour playing out. We don't control the result. We don't control the outcome. But under God... We influence the outcome of ministry. That's not an unusual thing. We see it in in loads of places of life, in loads of areas through the scriptures. Uh, You see it in parenting. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Start children off in the way they should go, and even when they're old, they will not turn from it. Does that mean I can control whether or not my children are going to become Christians? No. No. Of course not. But do you influence it? Yes, by training them well in the ways of following Christ. Uh, There's something very comforting in falling back on the sovereignty of God. What happens is all up to God. But if we're shooting blanks in ministry, we have to ask questions because what we do has a real impact. What we do as the people of God matters. The way we love, the decisions we make, they have eternal consequences. And that is terrifying, don't you think? But we can't avoid taking responsibility for how our love of God and love of neighbour drives our labour at making more and more disciples. We're not entirely responsible. But, and here's a warning, brothers and sisters, as we develop these areas of thinking about church and the task of making disciples, it's a recipe for grey hair and lost sleep. Listen to Paul in in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I've laboured and I've toiled and I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked and besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. He's anxious about the churches. He loses sleep over them. Now, part of it is he's getting kicked out and chased out and shipwrecked and all those other things that are taking place but what's driven out of his concern for all the churches. 
right? That's a disciple-making mindset. And how many of us struggle to pray for three people a day that we want to see saved? The individually and as a church, we need to keep asking under God, what am I and what are we bringing to the task of making disciples of all nations? And as we develop our, our theology of the sovereignty of God, I think it brings us to this little, that little catchphrase, uh, contented restlessness. At the end of the year, you want to be content. How are we content? Well, we're content because God has given the growth. We're content because we're thankful that our God is sovereign. We're content because we're out of great because because we're forgiven and loved by God in Jesus. So we're content, but we're also restless because we want to keep asking, how can this program be changed? How can this structure be changed? How can this area of ministry be, be changed? They don't have to be. But how can they be so that they're more effective, so that we can love people better? Where are we slowing the gospel down? Where is the gospel having impact? Where is it not having impact? How do we manage and, and rustle our resources? Where do we put them into or not into? Contented restlessness is where a strong theology of the sovereignty of God brings us to. We need to care about the outcome, not just brush them off or avoid them because God is sovereign. Let me pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, you bring uh, life together in amazing ways. As we reflect on you and who you are, your character, your majesty, your power and your strength, we bow and cower in, in, in light of your holiness and your sovereignty over all things. And we sit there amazed, not just that you would save us, but you would use us, weak clay vessels, to save others. We thank you that your plan is to work through us. And whether we're working well or clunkily, you're using those things to grow us, collectively as a church and individually as your people. Father, help us to develop a rich understanding of your sovereignty and our responsibility of how that plays together in ministry. Uh, give us boldness to think through what we do and the results that are coming from that. And give us the courage to do what we need to do for the sake of making more and more disciples. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want you to listen to this description of a pastor. You might see some of these words on the screen there, but feel free to close your eyes maybe, whatever helps you to focus the pastor is a person who loves you, who holds your hand, who looks after you. He's the person who's there for you in your darkest moments. The shepherd who holds the lambs and knows them really well. The man best known as the author of the message paraphrase of the Bible, Eugene Peterson, put it like this. He said in one of his books, the way that I understand the uniqueness of pastoral vocation is that it's insistently personal. You cannot do pastoral work in a programmatic or impersonal or organizational way. You've got to know the names of these people, know their lives, 
be in their homes. The unique vocation of a pastor is to know these people. Now, undoubtedly, there is a lot of beauty and idealism in this description, and it may remind you of Paul's ministry in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He describes a close personal relationship. There's the imagery of a nursing mother who cares for her children. Paul talking of his sharing not just the gospel, but his life with them. And there's another great description in Scripture in Numbers 27, verses 16 to 17. These are the words of Moses where he says, May the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out and come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in, so that the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. Now, Peter's, Peterson's description, Numbers 27, they do seem to be describing the same thing, but we need to look at the context of Numbers 27. You know, we have Moses, a man who is under the direction and leadership of God. Now, he's leading the entire nation of Israel from Egypt through to the promised land. Now, there's hundreds and thousands of people in this nation, and Moses is directed by God to prepare to pass this leadership onto Joshua. So if we follow the, the language and logic of Peterson's quote, does that mean that a pastor must know the names of all these people? Does it mean that the pastor must be in their lives? Must he be in their homes? Now, Moses clearly was not that type of shepherd, nor was Joshua. And we see descriptions of King David as a shepherd, and they don't seem to match the practicalities of Peterson's description either. Now, Peterson's description, yep, yeah, it's a noble, it's a worthy part of shepherding. But it takes that part of shepherding and expands it. It makes it the whole of shepherding. In Acts chapter 20, Paul speaks to the elders in the church of Ephesus about pastoring. And he says to them, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. So what's happening there? It's not just the personal, intimate, pastoral care of having tea with people, solving and praying through their problems. It's protecting the sheep from wolves. It's keeping watch over the sheep. And a verse later, we read that it's feeding them with the word of God. So the end goal is not for these elders to know all of their flock personally. And the pastor's job, it's not to solve people's problems. It's not to make them happy. It's to help them see the grace of God operating in their lives. And how does the pastor do that most effectively? It's through the constant and faithful feeding with the word of God. And that's where the grace of God through Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection is most clearly and vividly outlined. So what can happen when our vision and our concept of pastoring is limited to simply knowing people personally? Yes, any church can be limited to the number of people that the pastor can personally know. That a church might grow from a small number to 60 people, 100 people, maybe 150 if they're exceptional with people, but then it gets to a point where it might stop growing and it hasn't necessarily stopped for spiritual reasons. You know, it hasn't stopped growing because the ground is hard. It hasn't stopped because Satan is attacking us. Why has it stopped? It may be because of us, uh, because of the way we may have misconstrued the role of shepherd and without re realizing it, we may have handicapped the growth of the church and the capacity to make disciples of all nations. And here's another expected issue. Perhaps it's the new people as the church grows. Maybe they're threats to me being pastored. So Paul in Acts chapter 20, he shows the role and the shape of pastoral leadership is this. The pastor is to be the leader. The pastor is to rule and protect and feed the sheep by the word of God. And in that sense, the shepherd is more like an Aussie grazier. Now, I don't know a lot about grazing, or Aussie graziers myself, but I understand they look after thousands of sheep. 
Now, of course, we need to step back. We do need to remember and give credence to the fact that part of the shepherding role must be personal. Uh, There needs to be at times focused care when appropriate and necessary, centered on the word of God. But at the same time, we need to figure out with godly wisdom, how is it that the pastor can protect and feed and care for not just 50 people who know him personally, but 200 people? And then as we factor in growth, how do they protect and feed and care for 500 people, 1,000 people? The constant personal time becomes less. As much as we might like it to be possible, it simply cannot be. So we need to think. We need to have time for vision and strategy, and we need to build leaders and build teams, which can be a painful shift for some because some pastors can get into full-time paid ministry off the back of the vision that Eugene Peterson's quote gives us. Now, they have a desire to be there in that close personal sense. And once again, it's very admirable. It's not by any means ungodly. But we need only look at the example of Acts chapter 6 to see that there is a more vital role for the pastor to perform. You may know Acts chapter 6, the early church is growing. The 12 are wrestling with the issue of how to administer special care when their primary responsibility is to teach the word of God. And so they guide, are guided by the spirit. They choose seven men to fulfill this important role. And there's a flow on effect of that. The word of God continues to spread. That is the 12 are able to maintain their focus on word ministry. And no, we can only assume given the continued growth and spread of the gospel, the body of Christ is cared for. So it's an example such as this that should influence our concept of pastoring and shepherding. Now, as any flock grows, more shepherds are needed. Responsibility has to be spread. So it goes to say that any healthy growing church that is glorifying God needs to be identifying raising up and equipping other shepherds and faithful pastoral ministry. It's a ministry of the, of the pew as opposed to a ministry of the few. Every member in some way, shape or form can be a minister. Now think about it like mini flocks, and then you may have smaller flocks underneath those. And it's in those mini flocks where closer personal care can be more realistic and effective. So what does that look like? Firstly, we need to build a culture in our growth groups where people are looked after by the other sheep. Now, it's not just the person who's leading or facilitating the group. It's the members as a whole who embrace that responsibility to commit not solely to their own growth in discipleship, but to the growth of others. So there's accountability. There's prayer support. There are other tangible means that seek to make sure that no one member gets left behind or neglected. And we also need to build in our ministry teams a culture where the team doesn't just do a job, but they pastor and care for each other. So it's not like this. You don't just come together occasionally before a term or sometime during the week to plan what goes on, when it goes on. You don't just arrive on Sunday a few minutes or maybe an hour beforehand. You don't clock on for your role, fulfill that assigned role, and then maybe if you have time, debrief later on and leave it at that, essentially clocking off because you're done for the day or night. Now, that mindset, it's not a mindset that is conducive to a team that builds in a deep trust of one another or in one another. You share the struggles You share the barriers that may be challenging the ability of members to serve with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Going back to that first and greatest commandment that we were reminded of in session one. Because I think in these smaller flocks, these are the places where we are most likely to be open, to be honest, to seek wise counsel and give it when it's appropriate. Places where we can hold our brothers and sisters accountable and know that we also will be held accountable by them in our walk as disciples. These are the flocks where we know each other well. These are the flocks where we can build that sort of fellowship and devotion where care 
is at its most tangible and effective and essentially as an outworking of the second commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves. So we need to make an adjustment from expecting the pastor alone to be giving that close, intimate, personal care for all. So what does that adjustment involve? It involves figuring out with godly wisdom how we are going to do, accept, and be content with that personal, close, intimate, relational care coming not solely by the one, but through leaders or under shepherds that are raised up among us. Anyway, I hope that was helpful, having a bit of chance to chat through that and uh, getting your juices keen, continuing to think about our church life, uh, how we go about things, how we do things in practice. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, the fourth thing to develop. Um, Steve, can we see if we can just turn the television on behind you? I think it's on a timer and it likes to go off. <clears throat> Uh, so number four is develop an expansive sense of church family. Uh, so if you're in your booklets, we're on uh, page eight. Um, I think some of the stuff that I'm going to say here is some of the examples I'm going to give uh, are not things that we would actually come out and say but I think in practice, we sometimes behave that way. I hope that makes sense. Because I don't know that we necessarily say all of these things or think these ways, but in practice, it is what we do. So have you ever heard people say any of these? I don't want church to become too big. Church is meant to be a small, intimate, spontaneous family. <clears throat> we don't want church to become too big. Big churches are cold and unloving and they're impersonal. Big churches are just like organisations. They're not families. They're all professional and they smack of being a business, not a family. I like the personal and the familiar. I like a place where everyone knows my name. As we grapple with size, it's a hard adjustment to deal with. Um, I, I, I've been in it. Uh, my, my church life has been, uh, over the 35 years of being a Christian, uh, is has been in congregations from uh, the size of three, four people up to 200 people as regular attenders, uh, where the parish, the, the, the whole church, like all the congregations put together, has ranged from uh, 35 people to 800 people. I've been in churches where we've ranged from meeting on one site to meeting on four sites. I've ranged from meeting on one day of the week to meeting on three days of the week. I've ranged from doing it in one language, having church in one language, to having church in two different languages. I've never got up to three languages. in, But so I've seen a lot and there's differences with all of them. And, and the adjustment is hard to deal with. But love drives us to keep developing our thinking. And love drives us in particular to develop an expansive view of church family. Love wants to see church grow and grow and grow. Love that the lost will be saved. Love that Christians will find a home with us. Love that Christians will grow with us. Love that will send Christians away from us in a positive sense to go and be involved in ministry elsewhere. Right? It's, it's love for God to be glorified as lives come under the Lordship of Jesus. Let me share 
a common minister's recollection. So I'm not telling a story of anybody here, uh, but the type of story you could get from many, many, many ministers who've been in uh, church-based ministry for, for a number of years. So let me go into a recollection mode. I remember chatting to a lovely couple in our church who were complaining the church was getting too big. They shared that in their experiences, big churches are unloving. They're all about programs and they're impersonal and cold. We talked for a little while and I tried one or two different ways of persuading them. And then finally I just said, you and your family, you came here from a really hard church experience, didn't you? You've been really hurt in your old church. You came feeling uh, bruised and feeling vulnerable. And, and they both nodded. And he said, yeah, it was terrible. I said, well, imagine if on your first Sunday here, I'd said to your family, we'd love to welcome you in, but I'm afraid we're full. We've reached our optimum love limit. We've reached the maximum number of people that we can love and look after. And I know you've had a rough time and all that, but you'll just have to go somewhere else. And they stopped and paused and they looked at me and they said, well, we better find a way of loving more people, hadn't we? That's the answer, isn't it? I mean, imagine it's a bit crass, that story, but it's not a long way off the mark. This one really is crass. Imagine bringing someone along to church, a non-Christian that you've been praying for, and to have someone say, oh, it's great you're interested in heaven. It's great you're interested in becoming a Christian, but if you come here, I might not be able to know everyone. So you probably should go somewhere else. It's just gross, isn't it? Like to, to say it out loud, it's just horrible. But... There's something in the instinct about that that doesn't actually come from a hard heart. It feels hard-hearted, doesn't it? I hope it feels hard-hearted. But it, there's something in the instinct of it that's not from a hard, to, hard heart because there's something about the intimacy of, of small to mid sized churches that is wonderful. If you did um, nerdy data statistical analysis of church growth, when churches hit Often the case is when churches get to about 60 or 70, bang, they grow. To get to 60 or 70 is often really hard, but from there to 100 is often really easy because 60 to 70 is the beautiful sweet spot. You've got people, there's enough, there's resources are pretty good and things are humming and, and you've got there because people have been coming in, so there's a buzz and an excitement and it just seems to flow on. But then by the 100, now, now like there's all these extras, it, 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 now it starts to get harder and we've lost some of that intimacy. And But as we look around, we know the fields are ripe for harvest, don't we? So we can't not have an expansive view of church family, which means we need to find ways to love and to be loved as we grow. Again, the book of Acts is so helpful for us. Um, turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Not going to unpack all the details. Just want to uh, have a quick, just just read through it. It's a remarkable sketch of the church in the very early days. Acts chapter two, verse forty-two. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. 
Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What a great sketch of the church, isn't it? Providing for whatever needs arise. It's beautiful. It's harmonious. It's generous. Turn over to chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. And it goes on. The family is expanding. The loving is not functioning as well as it was. They've struck a problem with the distribution of food. So in love, they work out a new way for loving the expanding church family while still driving and not compromising the mission to make more and more mature disciples. It's love. It's love that sees the need to be an expanding church family. It's love is why we change. Love is why we'll organise ourselves differently. Love is why we've been making the moves that we've been making in uh, over the last year or so from trying to move away from serving on rosters to being scheduled to serve as teams because we want opportunities to be together, to get to know one another, to build those pastoral networks stronger, where we've got networks through growth groups, we've got networks through ministry teams. And they're the things that give us uh, scope to expand as a church family. The common learning from churches that have uh, continued being healthy, growing churches is they've developed in these four areas that we've been talking about. A biblical concern for numbers, a a stronger theology of the sovereignty of God, a rounded theology of pastor, and and an an expansive sense of church family. I don't think any of those are particularly out of our reach or beyond our thinking or or, or, or I think a lot of it is present in our thinking. Uh, But we need to keep working on those things because it does change and have implications for what we do. We're going to push into uh, the area of change in our next session, what makes change hard or easy. But what what would be great to do now uh, is if in your booklet there, there's a quote at the end of page eight and there was a quote uh, at the start of this this session on page five, uh, both pushing in along the similar sort of lines. Just for a moment, imagine what could happen in our area if our passion for seeing pay- people saved, our passion for gospel growth could drive us to make any change at Tom's within the bounds of faithfulness to see it happen. That's the first one. The second quote was question is, imagine if we let ourselves be consumed with grief about the idea that people are going to hell and if we were brave enough to say this has to change and we're going to be the ones who take responsibility for it and we're going to make that change knowing it will hurt us at least for a while. Imagine what could happen. Rather than imagine what happened, Let's take a few minutes now uh, to share what might happen or what might we do or, you know, as you've been thinking, going, what are changes? What are thoughts that why don't we do this? We need to do this or what's what's running through the head? So take a few minutes with uh, the people in your group. Um, then Jin Ming is going to be coming up and giving us instructions for lunch, I believe, uh, and saying, Grace, lunch is all ready to roll. Um, but take a moment now. We're halfway through the day. 
to reflect and go, well, what could things look like? What changes could we make? And uh, Jim Ming will be back and draw us together and uh, lead us in grace and instructions for lunch shortly. Thank you.